Uncle, I bring good news. The Field Marshal has agreed to your plan. Ha! Of course he has! I didn't doubt you for a moment, dear boy. Rutherford is accompanying him back to your manor in Porter's Older as we speak. They will await your return there. As will one other. One other? Who, exactly? Lord Havel was concerned that even if he could get the realm's armies to agree to an accord, he might not be as successful in convincing those with political power. He asked if I might have a solution, and I suggested a certain Imperial Lord Magistrate turned Liberator. One of your co-conspirators? Master Quinton would probably call me one of his, but yes. Another outlaw, then? Just the thing we need to put these rotten politicos in their places. Good thinking, Clive. I'm glad you approve. The more the merrier, eh? Uncle. Assuming Havel and Quentin can solve our problem with the armies, you still haven't mentioned how we might manage the grain shortages. Oh, don't you worry, my boy. The Seven High Houses will be seeing to that. They have all agreed to make the most generous of donations. Oh, of course, it did take a little persuasion, but luckily I had some unexpected help. From who? Why, you, my boy. Rumor has it that you rescued the Lady Ariane's head steward, Rockford, from a horde of bloodthirsty bandits. It was more of a handful. Well, the old battle axe was so pleased she had a shipload of talents delivered to my private docks by the next new moon. And when the other houses saw the parsimonious old crone's purse strings finally loosen, they as good as tripped over themselves in the rush to follow suit. <laughs> I'm happy to hear it. Now, I must be getting back to the manor. Join us there at your earliest convenience, would you? Of course, Uncle. And how, pray tell, will we get that grain to the capital if the roads are still overrun with Akashic? You'll find another bloody road. I only have so many men, and I'm not about to send them headlong into an ether flood. That is, unless you'd have them turn as well. Well, I'd certainly eat less. Oh, says the man with a belly bigger than a band of curls. My soldiers actually need their rations. Without any food to keep them going, they'll be dead even before you've sent them on your fool's errand. <clears throat> if I may, gentlemen, perhaps I might suggest an alternative approach. Though supply routes are indeed disrupted, there is no shortage of ships. Indeed, they bob away in every bay from here to Randalar, awaiting a safe haven. Allow them to make port and fill their bellies full of grain. And once those who crowd the cities are fed, ferry the displaced back to the countryside to work the fallow fields. Ah, but I'm sure that you wish to continue your discussion. Forgive the interruption. Two such firm friends as yourselves need no help from the likes of me. Rutherford spoke fondly of the great bond between you. Us? Friends? I can't stand the man! Clive, I'm beginning to question the quality of the company you keep. And what kind of company are you expecting him to keep? The man's a criminal! Criminal? How... how... Dare you! You are not fit to breathe the same air as this fine, upstanding young gentleman. Upstanding? He calls himself Sid the Bloody Outlaw! Once more unto the breach. <sighs> Shall we begin again? What we seek here is not to create a new nation nor to claim the thrones of those that already exist. We wish simply to bring stability to the realm that mankind might weather the current storm. And to do that, we must convince those in power, the generals, the statesmen, the nobles, that our cause is just. There will be disagreements, yes, and I imagine some resistance, much resistance, but we cannot let that deter us. If we show them the path, Show them that we walk it ourselves. 
then I am confident they will follow. The fate of the world lies in my nephew's hands, but the well-being of her people lies in ours, and we must not squander the chance that Clive has given us. Uncle Byron, I... Now, with that settled, let's move on to the signing of the Accord. For what great moment in history hasn't been accompanied by a little ceremony? <clears throat> Citizens of Valisthea, I present to you the Triunity. Rutherford, my quill. Well, my boy, the stage is set. That it is. This is the role you were born for. Now I ask only that you trust in the talents of your supporting cast. We shall play our parts to the best of our abilities, that you might have the opportunity to shine. The realm needs its Sir Crandall, and there is no better Crandall than you, Clive. I uh, want you to keep this signed accord as proof of our faith in you. I will. Thank you, Uncle. Sorry, can't take you where you need to get to, but the Argo and me will be waiting when you get back. What do you think that thing is? It's a damn dis- and How the hell is Sid gonna deal with that? <laughs> Should have seen him. The thing didn't stand a chance. Yeah, neither did you, I hear. Welcome back, Sid. Welcome back, Sid. Yes. Welcome back. Trip wasn't too much of a pain in the ass, I hope. Truth be told, it was me who suggested roping you in to help with the trial. But from what I hear, things didn't go quite as planned. No. They most certainly did not. Amber lost his nerve in the face of a beast of prey, but he didn't lose heart. He pressed on, and he achieved his aim. And is that not what we ask of our scouts? Indeed it is. Thank you for your honest appraisal, Sid. The fact remains, however, that Ember will not always have a battle-hardened warrior on hand to pluck him from the jaws of peril. All I have gleaned from this trial is that without someone watching his back, Ember is little more than a liability. Wait, Sergeant. Ember still has much to learn, it's true. And this time he was found wanting. But I'd say he's due a second chance, nonetheless. After all, he did do as you asked. With a bit of hard work, any hand can be made to hold a blade, and any mind can conquer its fears. But a scout's nose is different. You've either got one, or you ain't. And by sniffing out that log, young Ember here has shown he has a conch and a half. Wouldn't do to waste it now, would it? Fine. One more chance. I'll do whatever you ask. I'll spend my days and nights in the pit if I have to. I'll show you. Just you wait. Delft as a brush there, huh? But his heart's in the right place. Just like someone else we know. And if you ask me, we've been leaning on him for far too long. 
About time the curse breakers took some of the weight off his shoulders, I reckon. You couldn't hurt. Just don't tell Gav I said so, will you? I won't have him thinking he's been hard done by. <laughs> Next thing you know, he'll be asking for a day off. <sighs> Chance would be a fine thing. Back to work. Forgive me, Sid. This did not play out as I expected. <laughs> Things really do these days. But that's why we need men like Ember more than ever. Men who can make the best out of a bad situation. Remember that. I, I will, Sid. Thank you. Sid, I wanted you to know. I will be taking personal responsibility for Ember's combat training. And I will not let you down. Vivian. I found it. The book you lost. You... you found it. Thank you, Clive. Even though I asked this of you, I was not entirely sure it would be possible. I feared the executors had seized every copy. I met with one of these... executors. And I convinced him to let me keep it. He told me something. That the truth is just a matter of collective belief. And that if enough people believe a lie... That lie becomes the truth. It does. But it also means that the truth is not immutable. That it can be changed. Provided that those who wish to change it can convince enough people that their perspective is the correct one. As the sad history of the bearers proves. You said that the book inspired you to become a scholar. It did. Or its author, rather. She was a heretic, you see. A firebrand and a dissenter. A gallows stood ready for her in every corner of the realm. And by shunning society, or perhaps being shunned by it, she stumbled upon a truth so potent that an entire realm trembled at the prospect of its utterance. I, too, have always felt somehow set apart from the world of men. A stranger to my own species. She taught me that my solitude was not a curse but a gift, and that, though my journey to the truth might be a lonely one, what I found at my destination would be more than worth the cost. Do you still feel that way? That you're not... one of us? Honestly? I'm not entirely sure anymore. Since coming to the hideaway, I find my thinking somewhat... clouded. Perhaps the result of studying mankind from a rather closer perspective than I had intended. But the more I study, the more I find value in this perspective. In looking not from the outside, but from within. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to continue my work here. Remember, Clive, when enough people believe, Belief begets truth. Give the men and women of this benighted world the gift of truth. Make them believe in you, as I do. I'll try, Vivian. I'll try. I read Gav's report on Stonia. <laughs> Only wish I could have been there to see the Mother Crystal fall. It's just a shame it wasn't the last. 
assuming that thing looming over the mountains is a mother crystal. Twin sides hundreds of leagues away. That would mean the crystal is massive. Why? Ah, oh, I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Is everything we've received and everything promised? You earned this. All yours. All done? Feeling ill? Don't push yourself too hard, Clive. Greetings, Lord Marquis. Have care, my lord. Thank you, my lord, for taking me in. Everyone here has been so kind. It reminds me of home. so loud. The Jedi would sneak me some gruel from his bowl. I miss him. He would have liked this place. I hear that you traveled to Ash, Sid. Did you by any chance recover the names of my fallen friends? I did. Yes. If I may, the Bearer Registry. The director was a brutal man. He got no worse than he deserved. The registry was all I found beneath the tree. There was no sign of a body. Nor any record of what happened to the children after the orphanage closed. I pray that at least some of them survived. All their names are here. The ones we lost. My friends. My light in those dark times. I can still remember their faces, like it was yesterday. Children who were taken from their bunks in the morning, never to return. No explanation ever offered. They'd be happy to know that you survived, Herman. But why did I make it out alive, when so many others died in that awful place? It's not your fault. And blaming yourself won't bring them back. Honor their memory. See that their names live on. That way, at least. They're never truly gone. 
Thank you. Sid, I'm going to write a book. An account of the horrors of Badbach, and the spirit of those its custodians sought to crush. All of Valisthea will know of our suffering, and in the name of those I lost, I will not let it happen again. Neither will I. These records would have been buried for all eternity, were it not for you. <laughs> Thank you. The realm will hear of Badbach. And I pray that the tale of my fallen friends will spare future generations the horror we endured. Thank you for helping keep their memory alive. Tell me this is all you need. Ah, oh, you make it sound like I asked you to save the world or something. Tell me this is all you need. It's most of what I need. After you left, I went over the figures again, and I realized I'd forgotten a one and a zero. <sighs> And... And a cogwheel. Just a tiny one. Though, that's the problem. Gears that small are a bastard to make, and I may have lost the one Blackthorn spent a fortnight toiling over. Wait. The children... When they took apart your scales, there was a tiny brass gear. Now that I think about it, I... They... Didn't use it... When we put the scales back together. The young'uns? But why would the... You know what? I don't want to know. I'll keep working on the model. You go and find that cog. Don't look at me like that, Clive. I already apologised to Blackthorn. Miserable old bugger. Besides, you can't expect me to keep track of every nut and nail floating about this place. It's a mess! Middadol mentioned a new project yet. Sid! Is Mid still hiding from us? She wasn't hiding. She's fine. She's just busy working on her next project. A new invention? What is it? What is it? Is it an airship? I bet it's an airship! Do you think she'll let us help? That just so happens to be why I'm here. She needs something special, something only you three can provide. A brass gear. A tiny one. One that might fit on, say, a set of scales. Oh, the one you forgot! We remember! We saved it, just in case. It's in the bag of bits. Since your lesson, we've been disassembling, then reassembling everything we can find. All the pieces that are left over, we keep under our beds, just in case. That's good to know. Look! I found it! Is that all? Just the gear? We have more parts if Mid needs them. That's all for now. But I'll let Mid know about your... hoard. Just in case. Thanks, Sid. Back for another part. We've got screws and bolts and nails and nobbles and noodles and, um...
Well, did they have it? They did. And they kept it somewhere nice and safe. Will it work? Will it work? It's perfect! You're a genius, Clive. What exactly are you going to use it for? Only the most important job of all. The wings aren't going to move on their own. But with the right cog in the right place? Well, you just wait and see. That should do her. Here goes nothing. <sighs> Titan's tits. It wasn't supposed to fly, was it? Of course it was supposed to fly. Wouldn't be much of an airship if it didn't. Honestly. These bloody engines are driving me mad! I was so sure this would be the day she saw it. The Mithril engine was made to make dreams come true. But maybe this is one dream the world's better off without. Show folk how to take flying. It won't be long till they're raining death down on each other. People will lose their homes, children, their mums and their dads. Like I lost mine. I'm sorry. So am I, Clive. So am I. Sorry that I have to choose. Do I follow my head or do I follow my heart? Good question. The first time I stood on the deck of your ship, felt the wind in my hair. It was like I was flying, but imagine how it would feel to actually do it. My dad always said there were two ways of living life. Chasing a dream or shuffling to your grave. And he were right. Right about a lot of things. Not that I like to admit it. People need dreams to chase. Especially in a world like this. Right. When this is over, I'm going to take all my Mithril engines to Zemeckis and sling them over the edge. I won't have my dream end up turning into someone else's nightmare. But all that hard work... All that hard work will not be used for war, Jamie. But it ain't like it'll be gone. Tell me, Clive, have you ever been on a treasure hunt? Not since Joshua and I were boys. Why do you ask? Because I'm going to bury the engine schematics and leave behind a little riddle telling people where to find them. A really hard one, so that only the most dedicated dreamers will ever be able to work it out. Ooh, <laughs> I can picture it now. Some daft general squinting at the words with a gormless expression on his mug. Like that one, yeah. <laughs> right. If I'm putting this engine at the end of a treasure hunt, I'll still need to make it a treasure worth hunting for. Won't be much of a prize if it couldn't even make a toy boat fly after all. <sighs> My dad always said, dream big. But it in the size of a dream that's important, is it, Clive? Only that it's a good one. 
And I reckon I've got a fair few good ones left in me. I'm sure you do. What shall I do with your model? You spent a lot of time on it. We both did. What, that old thing? Not healthy to cling to your failures, Clive. But weigh you down, you know. Sound advice. Still, I suppose my prototypes will probably be worth a fair bit when I'm as famous as Bart's the Builder. Seeing as you're always strapped for coin, suppose I can give it to you. Just make sure you get a good price when you do come to part with it. I'd say that was up to you as much as me. All right, Clive. <sighs> Make a name for yourself. You better bloody add to and all. Enjoy it while you can, Clive. <laughs> Imagine that, eh? Till then, though. Give a melon off, Clive. Has Midadol mentioned a new project yet? What you will, maybe Karen has seen ourselves have a long way. Crack the crystal. Not a very good one. But then. I saw myself. No scratches, right? Anything else? So what do I owe the honor? So what it be? Last you a good while. Anything else? Something troubling you? Uh, no more than usual. It's just... Yeah, this baby will be coming soon, and I wanted to make something for it. I'm sure she'd like that. Back in the north, 
Families would always make gifts when a bairn was on the way. I let the little tykes know they were welcome in their new homes, like. So, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that Ed is due any day now, and I don't know if I'll be ready in time. Is there anything I can do to help? Hmm. You know, there just might be. All right, then. What exactly are we making? A good luck charm. But not just any good luck charm. Not just any. No. One made from the feather of a silver chocobo. <laughs> There's no luck yet in all the realm, or so we used to say back home anyway. Thing is, they're hard to come by. Had Otto and Karen check with their suppliers, but nothing. I'd try and track one down myself, only... Only the big day is fast approaching. And that's all you need, a feather. That or the bird whose arse it's attached to, aye. I was gonna start by asking around with travelling traders plying the northern borders. Well, there's no shortage of those passing through Martha's. I think I might make that my first port of call. I'll let you know if I find anything. You're a good friend, Clive. I won't forget this. I can't say I've ever seen a silver chocobo myself, but I have seen one of their feathers. Look just like a normal one, only silver, obviously. Well, grey. What's on your mind, Clive? Right.
If Joshua was worried about Jill, I should go and speak with him. It's usually me making demands of Hippocrates. I wonder what this is about. <laughs> 